I'm not being presented today. <laughs> I want to share a story uh, when I was a kid. Uh, you know, I lived in a normal, well, not normal, but, you know, uh, a middle class family weren't in an abusive situation. And <clears throat> I remember around, uh, I was about six years old, and my father got really ill. And I remember my mother telling me about it that, you know, dad's not going to be able to play with you as much, and he's not going to take you to your tryouts and stuff like that. He can't do that. And uh, I think our family doctor, back then, he used to have a family doctor, a GP. Dr. Jan Quinto came, and I think he tried to explain it to me. And, uh, you know, I was probably agreeing with them and everything like that, but the way my mind was structured in self-centeredness, the only way I could really interpret it is, what did I do wrong to make my father not to want to play with me? Yeah? This is self-centeredness, and it's a disease of mind. Yeah? Everything is seen as how it pertains to you. And in the Course of Miracles, I was just talking to a, a Course of Miracle master, and um, I may have gotten this wrong, but they have a lot to do in the book, Course of Miracles, about guilt, this inherent guilt. And so let's, in the way I see it is, let's say you hear about the beauty of life and everything is perfect and you're the source of love and all like that. And then your daily experience is quite contrary to that. You know, people are giving you the finger and you know what I mean? You don't look like you're being welcomed too much in life and stuff like that. What's one's head, if it's structured in self-centeredness, gonna do with that? It's gonna, it's gonna have a story that somehow you had something to do with, with it not being the way it could be. Yeah? That somehow it's your fault that there isn't love and you're not in peace and you're not this and you're not that. And once you're caught in that, it's going to promote a drive to get out of that. And that's how you're in it. When you're driven to get out of a seeming place that's not so, that's what makes the place seem real. Just like that whole time when my father, every time he didn't show up for me, that feeling, that sense that I had must have done something wrong came up. And it got validated every time by how I perceived the situation. The situation was my father was sick, but that's not how I perceived it. My mind used it to sort of verify that something was wrong with me. Yeah. And what happens, let's say for me, that, dis dis that irritability, restlessness, and discontent grew to such a point, I was dying for relief. I needed to get out of self. I needed to get out of that system of thought and interpretation. And so in, in uh, I remember I was like 11 years old, 12 years old, and uh, after a night game of, of Little League, my mother hadn't come to the game, someone uh, introduced me to a beer. And my first beer that night, my athletic career came to a screeching halt because I didn't know what I was looking for, but I knew when I found it. And beer gave me relief from that bondage of self. I, you know, I didn't care what my batting average was. All this stuff that had been given so much importance, because remember, you and I are given everything the meaning it has. You know, we give it breadth and width. We give it weight. And I was living under all this, this extraordinary weight about how important every little freaking movement of the day was. I couldn't sit down and take a shit without a lot of thinking about it, you know? Why should I, why am I shitting now? What did, you know? It's just insanity. So, once I started drinking, I got relief, yeah? But the relief was very temporary. And so I kept going back to that same well, and the payoff cost ratio really sucked. In the beginning, the payoff was pretty good. Cost wasn't so bad. But as it progressed, the cost went up and the payoff went down. But after it got to such a point, I couldn't get out of the contract. You know, I was powerless over alcohol and my life had become unmanageable. Now, I don't believe that my life became unmanageable because I drank. 
I believe the second statement in the book about being an alcoholic, which is we're an alcoholic and that we cannot manage our own lives. That, that was clear to me, yes? So in a sense, my dilemma was I'm not managerial quality, but I, all, the only thing I know how to do is manage, yeah? <laughs> it puts you in a big of a bit of a vice. Yeah. <laughs> and so while you're living that way, it's sort of like you make a decision based out of fear. They set off these trains of circumstances that bring you misfortune. You feel you don't deserve. So then what happens? You go back and make another decision based on fear. More trains of circumstances. More misfortune you feel you don't deserve. And basically, the only solution at that point is to drink or use. you got to get some relief from that loop because the loop keeps reoccurring. Yeah? And uh, you spiral down. And then what happened was I ended up, after a lifetime of drug addiction and drinking until 36, I spent two years and three months in programs, two year one stint and three months in another program when I was younger. Been in jail a lot. I've been in hospitals a lot. A lot of things have happened. A lot of consequences. I was sitting in a trailer park. I don't know if I said this two years ago, but I sit in a trailer park. I had gone out drinking St. Patrick's Day, and I uh, ended up three days later in this town north of San Francisco, pretty much washed up. And it was weird. I was waking up drunk. You know, I drank so much alcohol. When I passed out, I'd wake up. I'd still be drunk. And I was drunk stupid. I couldn't even put two sentences together, you know. And so I was sitting in this this trailer with this guy, drinking a bottle of Royal Gate vodka. It's a very high level of vodka, about 80 cents a pint. <laughs> <laughs> I love their customer service because realizing their clientele, they switched from glass to plastic. Because <laughs> before you drop it, your night was ruined, now it bounces back up. <laughs> I was I was very intimately in relation with Royal Gate Vodka for years, <laughs> and I was drinking this vodka with this guy, and I was looking at him, and he had a big bulbous nose and very close veins on his face, and I came to the conclusion he was a fucking bum, you know, this guy's a bum, but lo and behold, it looked like he was seeing me as a bum, <laughs> and for some for some reason that triggered what we call in recovery the moment of clarity. Where uh, something occurred where my the selfing stopped, and I didn't know that was possible. Yeah, that narration, that flow of narration, had been going on for so long. I figured that's that's what it was, but I had I didn't have any idea that it could actually stop, but it did, and it stopped for a couple minutes only, for two minutes, but that stopping allowed other information to download. And I didn't pick up another drink. I didn't when he passed it over to me. I didn't pick up. And a second before, I was dying to have him pass that vodka over to me. Now I said no. And then suddenly, suddenly, I had an idea. I gotta go call up someplace to get help. I wasn't thinking of this five minutes before. I was just trying to stay loaded until I could get some drugs. But now I think now I, there's some concern about my uh, <laughs> my own life, you know. So I. Uh, and it motivated me to leave the, the trailer, and I went to a phone booth. I called the program I'd been in, Delancey Street, and I'd ask them if they'd take me back. But they'd been getting my newsletter for the last ten months, which was, and they said, no, you, maybe you can come back in a month and have an interview. That doesn't mean you'll get in, but we'll, we'll interview you again. And I said the first honest thing I'd said in ten months, and that is, I don't think I have a month, you know. And what occurred is, this download, it was only two minutes, but I'm still riding the, the wave of that for 24 years in manifestation. It's pretty mind-boggling, yeah? It was just a little bit of an interruption in that stream of selfie. But that little pause, what came through, has been a living solution for 20 years, for 24 years to the, to the disease of alcoholism. And the fourth, the thing. So I didn't come here. I didn't get into recovery. I'm talking about recovery because that's what I'm intimate with, you know. That I felt like doing that today. So bear with me. Uh, I didn't come to recovery like a lot of people do, which is a bottom. You know? When I would hit a bottom, I would move in. 
Seriously. <laughs> I would get curtains and I'd invite you over and try to hang out as long as I could, but I'd always be evicted to a lower bottom. But I didn't see that anything could be low enough to stop me, because I kept going lower and lower, you know. And uh, so this was just a regular day at the office. I was just drinking and trying to stay high until I could get some drugs and... And yet, something interrupted it, and I would say that's something. I would just, I wouldn't say anything about it, because I have an intimate sense of it, but I don't know it at all, you know what I mean? That's what's so beautiful about it. I'm intimately filled with it, but I have no idea about it. So, but I've intimated it through the 24 years, you know? I've seen its sort of invisible hand in my life, and I've had the joy to see it in many other people's lives, you know, on a lot of levels. So the faith in mine doesn't come out of the blue for me. I've seen it demonstrate. And for me, the demonstration that life offered in this life was the release from the bondage of alcoholism. And considering that that was the biggest influence in my life here, to have that all of, all of a sudden stop and never to have a drink again since then, that's a pretty damn big demonstration. And you know, I have one ability I do have, which I'm really thankful for, is that I have the ability to be convinced. I didn't know I ever had it, but I don't, now I do. Because I hadn't died, so I, I would stayed up, I stayed here long enough to be convinced that there is a solution. And once I got the relief from the alcoholism, which is, to me, just an extreme subdivision of self-centeredness. It's just painted with a broader stroke, which is actually very helpful because you can recognize it better. And once you recognize it, it can be applied to the real disease, which is the mind's addiction to being a self. That To me, that's the original disease. Every other addiction is to try to get relief from that addiction. That's why once you get rid of one addiction, other ones usually pop up. So let's say you stop drinking and using, and then people get into porno or sex acting out or become workaholics or somehow. Because the mind, it still has that flow. It still has that drive. It's trying to get out of something it's not in. So it can never be successful, yeah? That's, that's the form of addiction. See, addiction, when you shoot coke, you never get to a point where it's enough. You never get that one shot, like the 50 or the 100 shot, and you go, thank you, coke. That was all more than enough. I've reached cocaine satori. I'm done. You know? Stuff like that. No. The addiction, when I would do a nice hit, I'd enjoy it for, let's say, 10 minutes. But then I, the next hit, I'd have to do another one in 8 minutes. The next hit would be 5 minutes. The next hit, 4 minutes. It would just be on and on and on and on and on. Because it wasn't about getting the relief. It was the looking for it. It's the seeking that's the engine. It's the seeking. The idea of finding is just a part of the engine of seeking. It has no intention of really finding. When it does find something that works, it usually looks for something else that will work better. The seeking never comes to an end. Yeah. It has so much momentum, and it's being fueled every time you're looking. <laughs> <laughs> Spiritual seeking is just a subdivision of it. Yeah, it's the same thing, exact same thing. But you don't have any programs for it. <laughs> I mean, I'm you know we should. I wish I could do an intervention on some of us. <laughs> yeah. Okay, stop buying books. Don't get the Omega booklet or whatever. Don't sign up for another fucking retreat. <laughs> just sit here. And read something, a de detective novel or something. No, no. <laughs> They'd be all right with their son. Like, oh. <laughs> Put on Celine Dillon or something. Get something, something. me back to the... <laughs> Mind is agitated, yes. It's being stirred all the time by looking for solutions to it. The solution stirs the problem. And I don't believe stirring leads to non-stirring. <laughs> I just don't. Don't. So. 
So when I had that, when the alcoholic, when the consequences of alcoholism, active alcoholism, were dismissed out of my life, I got a chance to actually see the root of the problem, you know, the exact nature of the wrong, or however we put it. And I had been up, you know, I had a lot of studying, because when I'd be on a coke run, I'd be up seven to ten days. I was seeing a lot of mind (laughs) for ten days straight, and I saw it in all its glory, and I saw the beast, but I never had... An, a, an ignition, or a, I never had the match to burn that bonfire. And when I came and I heard this message after 11 years of sobriety that I may not be that, that was the trigger. You know, that's what became the last answer. Then, because all the information was there, it was all ready to fire up. There was just something missing, a little possibility that I hadn't entertained. Because I was busily trying to entertain being free as Paul. But I never really entertained being free from Paul. Yeah? Everything was, I was seeking relief for Paul, but not from Paul. Yeah? And if you're seeking relief for Paul, you're going to be busy seeking relief quite a lot. (coughs) Because the sense of Paul is ravenous. It's voracious. It will eat up every bit of relief you ever bring to it and demand more. Yeah? It feeds off of it. But from Paul, as soon as that happened in AA, as soon as I entertained the idea that it was an obsession with self that was the problem, it was identification as self. Now, I'm not saying it's identification as a thing called self. I'm saying identification as self is the verb. (coughs) There's an identification as self. There's not an identification as a real thing called self. There's an identification as self. Yeah? When I entertain that, that the real root of the problem is identification as self, that's when the relief got stabilized. That's when it became reliable. That's when it wasn't based on circumstances and situations anymore. That understanding outshone circumstances and situations, yes? And it wasn't based on my mental condition anymore. And it wasn't based on the narrative anymore. It was truly baseless, and therefore it's everlasting. Yeah. So now, what I thought was out there for me to have to find was now always available at all times with no requirement to meet it. Yeah. It was perfectly applicable. Wherever I am, no matter what, there are no requirements to be that except the considerations my mind may put up. Yeah. But if I'm not that, which is putting up the considerations, I lose interest in the considerations. Yeah? And so what's so is so. Yeah? And not just what's so is so, it's sowing. It's always what's sowing. Yeah? It's not a stabilized, stagnant thing while I'm trying to move around it and get in position to sort of get a trickle-down economy effect from it. No, I'm in that. I'm in that flow, yeah? And there's no way I can be out of the flow. And that's an absolute. There is no way in hell I can be out of the flow. The possibility of being out of the flow that the mind entertains is hell. That's what hell is. The hell are the impossibilities the mind entertains as possibilities. Just like it's impossible to be anywhere other than here right now. How hard is that to recognize? Have you ever not been where you are? I mean, how is it that we can keep entertaining the possibility? I could be back in California surfing, but I'm not. Yeah? I could have kids, but if I was a woman, but I'm not a woman. You know? These things go past my head, and it just goes off on, oh, it would be great if I would have been able to give birth to kids. Who the fuck knows that? It's all, it's just riffing. It's just riffing and riffing and riffing. But it needs the first note. Yeah? It's like, it's simple, really. If you walked into a jazz place and John Coltrane was playing, and you say, hey, John, riff on the theme separation. It just riffs. This is what we're doing. Our mind is riffing on the idea of separation. It's just riffing away so the source of love can feel like it's unloved. What an incredible event, you know? Obviously, it can't last forever, but it can appear in time. Yeah? So forever has to be forgotten for all these seems things to seem to be real because they are not real. They can only seem to be real. They need to be stretched out so that there has to be time. There has to be time to work the story. Yeah? <laughs>
<laughs> so something there can be an incredibly very logical take that an insane system produces it may sound very logical when you're under the influence of the insane system if you see the insist- insane system as insane you're free from that crazy logic you see it you see it you see the absurdity of it as soon as it starts chirping you know the whole tune yeah and the whole point is what can what cannot be the most reliable thing here than the context of every moment which is the seeing of it which is the conscious contact yeah the conscious contact is love because no matter how far we wander in the in the uh, in the halls of time every moment it's available because it's not of a moment it's always yeah so no matter how much we're trying to fool ourselves the availability of the solution is right there in the seeing of how you're fooling yourself People sometimes can describe depression so exquisitely. How are they able to do that without the clarity of mind? Without the mind being extremely clear, how can you be so clear about something that seems to be so dense and so dull? Yeah. Makes, it's what makes the exquisite suffering. It's not the movie, it's the audience. It's us. Yeah. The movie, if you see through it, it's tinny. It's the same old, same old. It's, it's like you're a runner around a lap, you know, like a, an oval, like a racetrack, and all that happens is your mind changes the scenery. It's the same, you're running around the same circle, but oh, hey, Joe, for late, oh, hey, Bill, or I'm in relationship with Sue, oh, now I'm with Mary. Oh, it's all different. Why? It's, I'm in a relationship with Mary. Oh, that makes, but you were in a race, relationship with Sue before. It's like when I got sober, I had to do a sexual inventory, and I looked at all the relationships, the bigger ones in my life. There was like maybe 12 of them, and, I, and none of them seemed to work. And then I looked at what constant was in all the 12. It was me. <laughs> it was going over my head. There were 12 different women, but there was only one me in them. And I thought, oh, maybe, just maybe, honey, I'm having a realization. I may have something to do with it. (laughs) How out to lunch can we be? (laughs) It's true. We have a thing in recovery called hungry, angry, lonely, tired. So I remember when I first got sober, I'd be walking home and I was having an existential moment. I mean, I felt like this universal thing was going on and it was so important and all I needed was a bologna sandwich. I hadn't eaten enough food that day. It wasn't any big fucking spiritual yearning. I was hungry. It was just chemicals doing their thing and then the mind making an absurd narrative around it. Yeah. I was in a tub one time, house sitting, and I, was, and I realized I don't want what I want. It was a great fucking moment. Because I had been living on an old spool that was like it was telling me what I wanted when I was like seventeen. I was like forty five. I cannot be parking near a junior high school and start asking girls out for dates. You know? It's probably not gonna work. <laughs> but here's the head doing the same thing. And I was realizing, Jesus Christ, this is like circa nineteen seventy two and it's two thousand and four. You know? Bing. I don't want I want. What's gonna happen? If the state of mind that they call a very high one in Zen is I don't know. What, pers- what comes after that? You find out. Find out is a much higher form of knowledge than knowing. Yeah? Knowing is always bookended, or always is going to move to its opposite, which is not knowing. Yeah? In a sense. But there's another level of not knowing that's not playing that game of knowing, not knowing. It's just not knowing. And in that, you find out. And to me, finding out is much more convincing than knowing. Much more convincing than mental knowing. To me, mental knowing neuters everything. Yeah? As soon as you think you know something, as soon as you entertain a message, you've made it something. That's not the message in a way. For me, any message that's worth its salt leads to or is about, about nothing. No thing. So that you're left with your own devices and you realize the way you're set up, your mind is structured, it can't embrace nothing. It can't embrace what is. You can't recognize what's always so. 
Yeah? Just like everyone in this room, I bet you not one of you were at a cafe today complaining about gravity. <laughs> the effects of gravity on your body. Not one. Not one person in any place in North. I bet you not one person in Raleigh was complaining to, with their significant other. You know, my, it's gravity. My left shoulder. Is it a heart lower than before? It looks like it's a lot heavier. No. Because it's happening all the time. You don't know its effects because it's happening all the time. You need to have uh, an experience out of it to realize you are in it. So you go up in space and you're floating or you go to one of those tanks and then you realize, wow, I'm under this incredible burden all day as this action figure. I'm being held down. Exactly the same thing with this message. We're like that fish in the water. We don't recognize the medium we're in. We recognize the seaweed and the other fish, but we have no sense that we're fucking wet. (laughs) That we're soaking. And we're all at this meeting trying to find out how to get wet, and we're drenched, every one of us. (laughs) Jesus. And we're willing to pay for a pool of $300 a month. Sure, I want to be able to go to that pool and swim in it. You're fucking wet. You don't need a pool. This whole event with me, to me, it's not an event. It's an it's happening. You know, it's alive. If it was an event, it would already be put in the spiritual museum. I'd be fucking worshiping it, and it would have no juice. You know what I mean? And sooner or later, it would have to get rigid and become dogmatic and stop blaming others, just like every other fucking thing that's been crystallized. Anything, every incredible message is being used the way they get used being made into something my mind you know but this 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 uh, it's just disarms you it econ- economizes you you get pared down knowledge isn't that that valuable to tell you the truth i'd much rather be in a need to, a need to know basis yeah it's much, you get downloaded what you need to know. You don't get a wealth of information. I don't live in downloads all day. They come when I'm doing a talk because they're not necessary before, you know, while I'm trucking around. This is like being economized and pared down. Yeah? And you and I cannot do that operation. We would cut out the things that are necessary and we would let things that are not necessary stay. Our our ability to recognize value is very skewed, very skewed, yes? So you come here, to me, I like repetition for this message. To me, the message is like, I was talking with some people today, let's say you have a car, it has the ability to run, it has the ability to take you where you want to go, yes? And yet it's broken down, but it has that ability. So you pulled over, you open up the hood, and then you take the air filter out if you have an old car, and you look at the carburetor, and you have your friends trying to start it, and it's not being able to catch, yes? And he's standing there, and I say, all right, turn it on, pump it a few times, and then you just drop a couple of drops of gas in, and the person, do, and then it catches, and that's the end, yeah? Now what's the next, what's going to happen next? Driving the car. What would happen if, when it gets turned on, if you keep putting gas in it? It floods. Yeah, to me, this is what this message is. I have faith in mind. All the mind needs is to hear a possibility. Then let it entertain it. If you keep pouring more gas on it, you're not allowing it to have some time to entertain the possibility it's just received. Yeah? So when I... That's why I like to call it a message. Have you ever gotten a, like a like a twelve minute message on your e- on your voicemail? Do you, have you ever listened to the whole thing? <laughs> Usually, oh, and by the way, yes, and this, and you know, fuck this, you know, just hang up. You know? It's not as, whatever they're talking about can't be that. <laughs> yeah. So a message is usually short. The invitation is like, come to the party. It isn't. It it doesn't describe why you should come to the party, what's going to happen if you don't come to the party. It's just an offer. Here, come to the party. That's the way I like it. That's how I heard it. I heard it, yeah, I didn't become a devotee from the person that it came through. I really have a lot of gratitude for her, but I entertained it. I walked around and entertained it, and I kept exploring until the entertainment got to a point where it wasn't, it would be a disservice to keep exploring. Yeah? It would be a disservice if I kept pouring gas in. 
it was time to drive, yeah? And what happened really, by a guy talking, not, this is how it happened, but this one was a good one. I went to some teacher, I don't want to name him, but he was using an old, old, very old Zen saying, and I'm sitting in the group, and I had a feeling that I was, well, whatever, whatever. <laughs> and he says, you know, he was talking about his own seat assignment. He says, you know, I'm like a man standing by the river selling water. And everyone started laughing, and it was pretty funny. But there, we were all there, standing <laughs> <laughs> buying water from a guy standing by the river. And then he started laughing. I had seen him before, and this time it sounded like, to me, a real authentic laugh. Not like it wasn't before, but it was pretty good. And he says, no, it's even funnier than that. I'm the man standing in the river selling water. And there I was, and I left. I said, thank you. <laughs> and walked out, never to go back. Because it was fucking obvious what was happening. I was in the water trying to buy water from this guy. <laughs> and the funny thing is, you'll find someone to sell you water. You will. A better water, a blessed water, an infused water. It's all water. <laughs> And you know what? I thought that was it worked for me. I entertained it. I started living, and I saw how how it worked here. Yeah, I don't really care about the absolute or. See, I think it's a great uh, business plan for spiritual businesses to have you believe it may take lifetimes to find you know finally culminate to what they're promising. You're going to be like a more than a one lifelong customer. You're going to be coming back for more and more. It's unbelievable. And yet they don't have to produce any goods. If they were factories, they would have been closed down. You know? They're not producing any spiritual awakenings. You are already awake. All that needs more is a diminishing of some state that's seemingly blocking you off from the state you are. Yeah, I would say it's the mental condition. If you lose interest in self, and I found the only way that that was really successfully able to stabilize what is when the self isn't me, that's how it was just a dog shit working. It wasn't because I was noble. I just found a little curious thing about it that I'm only interested in things that are about me. Seriously. So, how about I'm, I'm not this me that I'm in, extremely interested in? Voila, it worked. Yeah? So, if you're not that, yeah? if you're not interested in it, you get the mental condition diminishes, and what happens? Hallelujah! You may take an interpretation that it appeared, but it's always been available. Like a lot of people have said, it's been right underneath our noses. It's the open secret. It's the gateless gate. That becomes obvious to you. yeah. Not because you became a better self, but that you lost interest in the self. And I found it's, you, I found that everything that you meet, everything that mind meets, it can use that to gain interest in itself. Even things that are, are built to lead you out of self, the mind can easily use that to increase the obsession with itself. Yeah? That's what I found. But if I'm not that, I lose interest in it. My interest is freed, and then the interest that's freed now enriches my life. And maybe it, it may en enrich the possibility that I'm not that to become a, an absolute or a conviction. Yeah? And that's something that instead of living for an experience, I'm now living from a state. Yeah? A state that's much more long-lasting and not at the influences of what's coming and going. Yeah. And like someone said today, I found that satisfaction or contentment was what I was looking for because now that it seems to be obviously available, I'm not interested in all the other pursuits that I used to be interested in. Yeah. There's nothing like a contentment of mine. I work with people, and this one guy I work with in AA, nine years, he was sober, he calls me, and I, I'm a sponsor, I was, and he calls me up and he takes me to lunch. And uh, and I, I, while we're eating, he says, hey, I, went, I started drinking again a couple weeks ago. And he says, I've been drinking successfully, you know? I haven't been arrested, nothing, the roof hasn't fallen in, and stuff like that. And he went on and on and on about this for a few minutes. And I said, well... Can I ask you something? And he goes, yeah. How much do you think about this lunch with me? 
You know, how much do every time now, every meal you go to, how much do you think, should I have wine or not? Your mind is agitated again. You've, you're not content anymore. Yeah, the beast is woken up a little bit. It's like a big fucking dog. You teased it with a bone, and now it's awake. Now you've got to walk it, you've got to clean up after it, you've got to excuse it when it bites you and another person, and all like that. You've lost the most valuable thing, which was peace of mind. And you don't even know the heist is on. But now, that possibility of having a drink comes up all day. And it has to be debated. Should I, shouldn't I? Total engagement in that mental condition. Yeah? And when you're totally engaged in the mental condition, the quote-unquote spiritual condition, though always available, will be unseen to you. Yeah? It won't have any influence on you whatsoever. So, I'll tell you, a little relief may not seem much in your big scheme of things, but it's a damn way to feel that day. You know? It's a damn way. You can't put zeros and numbers over how it felt to travel light through a day. Maybe no one's even going to notice it. You can't have an accountant book. You can't seem to quantify it. But I damn well tell you, it will intimate itself over time, the incredible relief that's available. Yeah? When your mind is content. You know, all the partitioning of days will sort of, all the little partitions will sort of uh, become faint, and then you'll just be in one long, seemingly long event. Yeah? On, 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 on. And yet it's not even long, and it's not even an event. But your whole idea of time will shift. And I'll tell you, time is an incredible influence here in the mental condition. It's a huge part of the mental condition. Its whole thought system is based on time. Yeah, Self-centeredness. If you look at how you think and what you think of, look at where your thinking points to the value of life. It points to the past and the future, doesn't it? That's what it deems valuable. The thought system is about the past and about the future. You know? <clears throat> Can you imagine take, having that as your guide every day? What are you going to miss out the most right now? You're not even going to give it the, you're not even going to give it the biggest, the biggest of honoring. Yeah? To me, it's like a huge heist. It's slavery. It's really, it's a form of slavery. So St. Francis says, what's looking is what you're looking for. So if what's looking is what you're looking for, I would say that would pause a lot of things in your life if you entertain that, right? Wait a minute. If what's looking, which is happening now, is what I'm using to look for, what? What's looking? <laughs> Let's just cut out the middle man and woman. Let's drop out the what's looking uh, for, the looking for, and just get the what's looking, yeah? But it's only what's looking when I'm at a retreat. No. It's only what's looking when I deem myself to be a good person. No. It's it's not there when I've done something bad. That's a lie. All like that. So all the ment- all the mind is tr- attempting to do is moving, is trying to move you into a special somewhere out of everywhere. Yeah. And then when it moves you to the special somewhere, it wants you to find everywhere, but as a special somewhere. <laughs> you don't see that as slavery. There's not a like it says in the Bible: the Son of Man has no place to rest its head. So, when I heard this invitation, it became the last answer. And right now, it's still the last answer. That's a pretty good answer, right? It put all the questions aside, and there's no, I'm not looking for anything else. And that's how you really can see. Yeah? You really can see. When you're busy looking, you're blind to the seeing. You really are. Looking is, you know, it's a bastardized version of seeing. 
It's the mental interpretation of seeing. The mental can't get rid of the seeing, but it can interpret it away. It can turn it into a form of looking called self-centeredness. It can't make itself that, but it can use it for that, yeah? It gives it it gives the seeing its own meaning that it's you that's looking. Yeah. <laughs> and then it blinds you to the seeing, and yet all we're looking for is that. It's crazy, yeah? <coughs> you would have to see there was a purpose to that to keep you going, yeah? To keep an agitation agitation going. Even though the story is that you would really rest when you found it, but no no. Is it true? No. It's just about going. Agitation, seeking, 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 seeking. It's easy to get off a train you never got on. It is. You just have to entertain it. You never got on it. Yeah? Because there's so many ways to get off a train, but the best way is realize you're never on it. <laughs> every other train, every other plan to get off it will always leave you being back on it. <laughs> but if you were never on it, that's really being off it. Yeah? That's happened with me. That's what my mind... I don't know how I came up with it, but my mind got that and everything came to a screeching halt. <laughs> and then that pause became its basic state. Instead of thinking that that was a gap between its activity, the pause became the basic state of mind. Yeah? That living, eternal, non-moment moment. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It changes everything, yeah. Because you're giving everything the meaning it has, so the meanings change. And then you travel later in those. And then you can see traveling heavy, you really can. And you can see that there is a solution to it. There really is. Now, the solution may not be what's supposed to happen here. Who knows? But I feel motivated to keep on keeping on with it because I've seen a certain people, by entertaining this simple imitation, travel a lot lighter in their lives. And um, I think that's a great possibility yeah, to sort of investigate. Because it's taken to be, what we think is normal may not be. <laughs> it may be we may be truly insane <laughs> what we're believing to be so. <laughs> you know what I mean? What we're putting up with is incredibly intolerable, really. You know? To put off peace of mind as a future event is intolerable, isn't it? If, you weren't, if we weren't so civilized, if we were going to our 800 meeting and there was all these pictures of saints, we would be ripping those pictures off the fucking wall. We've had enough. I'm fucking frustrated. I don't want to hear another person say, there's nothing to do about it. Or like this. I'd fucking blow, you know, I'd just go crazy. Yeah. What we want is relief. That's all. You want to call it awakening? You want relief. You want an easing comfort in your day, in your situations, in life. And I'll tell you something. All those other pursuits may get, may get really dimmed down when that occurs. And when it stabilizes, you may be truly what you've been looking for. Yeah? Right as it is right now. Not as it, as, as it is in a special way, as it is. Dog shit awareness. Yeah. It's incessantly on. It's incessantly on. It never blinks. It never looks away. It's just on. Yeah. So. What are we doing today? <laughs> what did we start at four? Yeah. All right, all right. So you want to ask some questions? Well, hey, wait a minute. I want to go. Someone asked me for some, for some golden oldies. I want to run this one by you. You ever hear of Candida? You have Candida? Who is he? Is he? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. You ever hear of Candida? Candida is like a, a yeast. It's an organism. And um, it gets into your intestines. Yeah. And then actually it now can go everywhere in your body. And it likes like flowery foods. That's its fuel. Like things that are easily broken down into sugars. Yes? So... I remember I've, I've had a really long time I had trouble with um, my stomach. 
And so I tried so many things, and this one time I decided I was going to get the best probiotics. Yeah, they're made in Canada. They're coming in a little milk, and there's like 80 billion beneficial flora in there. And I drank, and it was expensive. You buy it a whole, we call it a whole paycheck back in San Francisco, Whole Foods. And it's about, it's about, it's about $48 a little box of this stuff. And I went for about a year and a half drinking this religiously with the hope, you know, this burning hope that to feel better, you know? I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I want to feel better. And I'm drinking it, drinking it. And so, you know, after about a year and a half, and I was saying, I think I'm feeling better, but I really wasn't, you know. The stomach was still basically the same chronic condition. So I set, so I decided I got in touch with this laboratory. And you're here, Smoky Labs. It's famous for uh, analyzing shit, basically. <laughs> so they sent me their little thing, and I got my things, and I gave them my three specimens of shit, and I sent it there. I was really excited, because, and he had, you check out boxes for you, what, what you want them to look for. So, uh, parasites, of course, and I wrote all, you know, checked all, and you paid more money for each thing. So, I got the results back in about a week and a half, and I was really excited. I rip open the envelope, I'm looking down, and I see in t- intestinal flora, that's where I was interested. And it says beneficial, any signs of beneficial flora, flora, zero percent. I said, what? Zero percent? I spent at least thousands of dollars with the highest form of yogurt. <laughs> there's not, there's, it's zero point zero 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 zero. There's absolutely nothing to be found. And then these other two big bacterias, they're huge. And I realized they've been eating the good stuff. <laughs> so I was producing a gourmet restaurant for them. <laughs> All under the idea that I was going to get better, that I was on the path to better, and I'm a really good seeker, and I'm following all the instructions. I was actually feeding the beast. <coughs> and the funny thing is, with these things like candida, they need flour, white flour and stuff. They can't go shopping. It's just like alcoholism. Alcoholism is a mental disease. It can't drink. It likes fuel. Drinking alcohol provides it fuel, Yeah. It can't shoot up. It needs the host to go get it for it. Same thing with candida, which is also in the body. It jacks into your head and tells you you really love bagels. Or you really like Wonder Bread. And you may like Wonder Bread. But the point is, it likes Wonder Bread. And it needs you to like Wonder Bread so it can get the Wonder Bread. And there's the same thing with selfing. The same thing with the mental disease called the addiction to self. It's the exact same thing. Something is living as you for itself. Yeah. That's why a lot of times its wants and yours seem so different because they are. Like in AA, they said, you know, the higher mind or the higher power, its intention for us is to be happy, joyous, and free. Can you say the same for yours? Can you say the same for yours? The daily mind that you seem to be living with, can you say say the same for yours? That it wants you to be happy, joyous, and free. No, it wants to be special and right. This is slavery. To, you need to, I don't know what you need to do, but for me it was very helpful because when I recognized it as a foreign installment, my mind immediately, immediately, immediately went to the possibility, hey, I could be free of it. While I was in the throes of being identified as it, I can never come to that possibility. I was always trying to be free for it or, fr- you know, as it. That's the form of slavery. As soon as someone gave me the idea, hey, Paul, it's a foreign installment. It's like I came to meetings of AA, and you know what meetings do? A huge thing. Most people are suffering from terminal uniqueness, especially in alcoholism and addiction. They're terminally unique. They don't think anyone understands them. No one thinks like they do or feels like they do, and no one does what they, you do in life. And you go into a meeting hall, and people are sharing their thoughts and their feelings and what they did in life, and after a couple of months of just listening... You have to come to either two conclusions. How did they get my thoughts, my feelings, and my reactions? Or they're not mine. And that was the opening of the big door. When I entertained that they were not my thoughts, the relief from them became available. Yeah, As long as they're mine, just like if you're in a park and there's 30 kids playing, where's your attention going to be on? On yours. 
Yeah? You're going to, your attention and interest is going to fixate on some level on what's yours. So if you're, if you're taking the thoughts to be yours, or you're the thinker of them, you're bonded to it. The mind is glued to it. The solution is from the, right from the get-go. Am I that? If I'm not that, I'm not beholden to it anymore. I can walk away. And I'll tell you, if it isn't about you, when you walk away, you will not look back. It'll be singing the sirens of Ulysses, yet you won't buy any of its advertising. Because it's just another mental hook. Yeah? So there is freedom from the bondage of self. It is available. The only reason why it's available is the bondage of self is an activity. It's not a condition. It's not so. The only relevance is, is it has is in when you're participating in that bondage. By taking false evidence as appearing real. So taking the evidence of being a, being in a body to being a body. The taking, you know, because there's a thought, I must be the thinker of it. Because there's doing, I must be the doer. Because I have a preference, because there's a preference, there must be someone who has the preference. This is called the bondage of self. So you stop trying to have preferences? Give me a break. You know, oh, I'm just going to eat something I don't like today. F- why? <laughs> you know, i got to study this. I prefer granola rather than gruel. Oh, there's a lot of selfing going on there. No, that thinking is the selfing. Yeah? Eat the gruel. Eat the granola. Yeah? Life is much simpler. What needs it, it's like missing the forest from the trees. We have such a magnification on the trees and we miss the whole sense of the forest. The sense of the forest doesn't come from studying these, the individual trees. It comes from a wider lens. Yeah? When you're not fixated on you, your lens opens up and then you get the intimation of the forest from every tree. Yeah? The tree is not in itself a tree, it intimates the forest. That seeing is large and expansive and it matches mind. I always like that thing about the mind is like open sky. I really like that. Because you see it. Let's say a plane's flying through the sky. It never calls the terminal and said, I ran into a big chunk of sky. Does it? No. No. Birds are shitting, but the shit usually lands on your car. It doesn't land on the sky. Yeah, When it rains, the sky doesn't get wet. Yet all of these activities are facilitated by the sky, but they don't have any effect on the sky itself. That's what mind is like. Selfing is an activity happening in the sky of mind. Our attention and interest is dwelling on that one cloud formation because we've fallen under the illusion that it's us. Yeah? We're... we're, we're we're uh, into it, yeah? So while I'm fixated on this cloud, I take that, sooner or later, I'm going to take that to be the whole sky. I can't, there's no sky in the, uh, in the. there's no influence of the sky, I'm just focused on the cloud, yeah? What happens if my lens opens up? Yes, I see the sky, and I see it's moving. It's an activity, yes? It's not so. It can only appear to be so for a period of time. But then I see the larger context, which is the sky. Yeah? And that will have a great influence on how you seem to travel here. Yeah? Any questions? No? I don't usually take questions at home. I use I usually leave it open for ten seconds, and I go, "Any questions?" I go, "No." <laughs> I when I used to go to the groups, the non-duality stuff, I used to think the questions usually led to therapy. You know, now, nothing wrong with therapy, but if you don't put the attention on the first point. How much help are you going to get on the fourth point to me? No, oh, yes. You sense it, hey? You sense it in the room? 
That's the transmission that uh, Bart was talking about. Yeah, all everything is imminent. Everything is a possibility, and so it's the mind that brings it into effect. Yeah, the mind, our mind. If we're willing to entertain, or if someone's sitting in the room with some certainty, it's like a weather vane. And so then something that was imminent but not of seemingly available becomes available. It becomes obvious. Yeah, that's what satsang is. It's the association with truth. It has that ability. In recovery, we talk about it as a loving God expressing itself through our group conscience. Yeah? So our group conscience is entertaining a possibility and it becomes a probability and then you sense something in the room, a sense of presence, hopefully, or at least where you're sitting, and that's it. That's mind and mind alone. Yeah? Mind is the receiver and the transmitter. All receiving and transmitting is happening in mind. It's not one to the other. It's happening. Yeah? That's what I love about the meetings because you, you get washed. Wetness becomes obvious for a little while. Yeah? As soon as you leave, you may, it may start again your head, but in fact there's a pause and there's a real joy and you get fed. You know, you get some fucking real nutrition. Because you can't eat a mental diet all day. Yeah? You feel, you'll you feel like you're full or you'll usually feel like you're not full and you'll just keep pouring shit in and you never get the sense of satisfaction, do you? You starve by opulent eating. It's a weird thing, eh? You starve by consuming. You consume so much information and knowledge, everything, and you're actually starving. You're starving from it. A little goes a long way. One possibility can open up the whole box. So learn about what you're not, and you'll in, in the seeing of that is what we are. That's the, the seeing of what we're not. That what gets that you're not that is what you are. Yeah. What what you're not's never going to get it. <laughs> it's what you are that gets it finally, because it's been a little confused <laughs> by the smoke and mirrors. It saw its image, a seeming image, and it fell in love with it. It's nothing right or wrong with it, but that's what it is. That's why in Buddhism they call it cherishing of self. There's an act. There's an action of mind. It's not like we self has been imposed on us. The mind cherishes it. It cherishes what it's making. Yeah. Yep. Would you please talk about some of your own vocabulary, selfing, download, action figure? Well, action figure is this, right? We're on a game board, and you're going to do things, yes? Oh, and seat position. Oh, the seat, all right. So action figure is this, you know? There's doing, as I was speaking about the other day, there's doer, you know? There's the doing. Uh, what was the other one? Downloads. Well, for me, downloads are uh, what happened that time in the trailer park, yeah? A download of information came in that was hitherto not available, yeah? And it didn't have the sense of time because a whole lot of information downloaded in a very short period of time. So it didn't come from a time-based depository. That was my sense, yeah? So that's, uh, that's how I feel it. Like when I'm doing a talk, I'm feeling a download. Downloads occur of information that's available, but it's not necessary when I'm walking around and hanging out. And the seat assignment is right where you're sitting. So right now the seat assignment I'm in is to share this message. But it's not like uh, it's not like a, there's no metal plaque saying Paul. This is Paul's seat. This place is musical chairs. You know, we're all going to get up, and then we walk around, and then you sit down again, and that's your seat assignment. Yeah. So that's what I feel about seat assignment. What about self as a verb? Oh, selfing, because there is there is no noun self. The if you you are listening intently with an intent, mind's intent to the selfing, there'll be a feeling that it's you listening. So selfing produces, right? Its product is the sense of being a self. So the verb is attempting to produce the sense of being a noun. It can't be a noun, but it produces the sense of being a noun. And it needs a whole lot of verbing to keep that illusion up. So selfing is going on quite a lot. So I, I see everything as a verb. I don't see any nouns at all. So I don't like to give it... You've already, you've already 
given it credence by calling it a self to me. You're already in the thick of it, in a sense, your mind. I need to be clear. Just if you see it as a verb, it changes a lot. A lot of things change. Yeah. So life is happening, not to you. Yeah? You're not a noun that everything's happening to. That's why that's self-centeredness. You know what I mean? You become the center of your mental universe. You're too pale of a moon to even reflect much light. Really. So you, that's that's it, right? See the assignment, yes. I like that, see the assignment. Some lady said that to me one day. I dug it, so I've stolen it off her. Because that's how I feel, in a way. You know? I was just doing AA talks, because I have a love of AA and the people in it. I, I, you know, I relate to them, because I come from that dilemma. And then we just, we made a mistake, and we put up a website, and then I started getting asked to all these other different types of meetings. <laughs> <laughs> but I still have a real fondness for, you know, people in recovery. Because I think they've had all the, they've had more than you need to have a, have a disillusionment occur, you know. They've, they've lived the, uh, the principle of any life run on self will will not be successful. They've lived the life that self is what has defeated us. They are, a lot of us are very clear about that. We're just not clear what to do. Yeah? Or what not to do, really. And so I wanted to put in a new plank in the AA venue and start speaking about the problem as an identification as self, not as an obsession with self. Because I think an obsession with self is what the mind does to reinforce the identification. So you'd be, ta- you'd be trying to address a secondary uh, activity as the cause, and you're not going to get radical relief. you got to get to the root. So I found out for my own self you know, my own self, my own life, that identification of self was the living dilemma, yeah? It's an appearance. It can't actually produce anything, but it can it can make an appearance of being a self. So I try, that's what I've been attempting to share for years in AA and everything, and coming to these places. Because I'd like that to be an established uh, understanding when, or as a possibility when you entered recovery that you could hear this message. You know, because I've seen a lot of people. Uh, the only thing mine lacks sometimes is the, the the possibility to entertain. Yeah, they just haven't heard something yet. The ability to entertain it's there, but they haven't heard something. So I think everyone has the right to hear whatever there is, and then see what your mind entertains. For me, this one was really helpful when I entertained this possibility in AA. It really, it, it, it just blew out my idea of AA and changed it and revised it, made it, and, you know. It's just, uh, yeah. It's a perfect way for me to live to express this, what I'm entertaining, yeah? It works for me perfectly. So, uh, it's sort of like the light. You want to bring it in, because it, it's, it's not a path itself, but it can illuminate every path, Yeah? The recognition of what you're not can illuminate every path that you're on. But I don't believe it can be uh, found through a path, but it illuminates any path. Like in Buddhism, if you see, they have the Eightfold Noble Path. He describes the problem, or he supposedly, who says, who knows if it was Buddha anyway, you know? But the four four noble truths, and then it goes into the Eightfold Path, and the the, sort, the cause of the malaise or the discomfort is desire, supposedly. Yeah? To me, I expanded that a little and say it's the mental addiction's desire to become and unbecome. That's what's happening, and that's what selfing is. See, it's not just a desire to become because this is a dualistic projection, yeah? So it's always got its opposite. So the selfing is always trying to become something it isn't and unbecome something it thinks it is, isn't it? It's always trying to get better or whatever, you know? And then it goes, okay, well, the Eightfold Path, the first part of it, if you look at it like a linear process, it's the right view. And then it says right livelihood, right meditation, a lot of rights after that, right this and right right understanding. But I think uh, there can't be right meditation without the migration of the right view. I think the right view migrates to make everything else right, you know? And I don't think you can meditate yourself into the right view. Maybe you can, I don't know. 
You know, I'm not a believer in that that much. But if you entertain the right view, then whatever you're doing is right, in a sense. Yeah? Really fucking cool. I believe. Really. Because the right, so the right view, and in Buddhism, the right view, I would say, in a lot of the schools, is non-self. You know, anatta. So the idea of having the right view will cause a rightness uh, to permeate everything else that you seem to be involved in. Yeah, but if you're trying to use what you're involved in to get to the right view, I think that's off, humbly. Yeah. Over the years, I found that to be a fail for me, anyway, because I was attempting to do that. I was trying to do the, the right things to get to the right view. Yeah, but I found the right view lets me to do almost anything. So now I'm like a free range alcoholic. You know? <laughs> I can roam, roam around and do whatever. <laughs> yes, yeah. And we'll end soon, right? Yeah. Are you ready? I get the bit about um, the thoughts aren't my thoughts. That's kind of cool. Where did it come from? What? The thoughts. The source. This is sort of a one on one question. <laughs> <laughs> better, I would be, you better ask who wants to know that would probably be more valuable than to know where they come from. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. That's my view. Good question. Yeah. So you're on this step five, right? And you belong to zero from yesterday. Square the five. Self, the self that's not a self. I'm entertaining the, the idea that I'm not a self. It seems to be a self that's entertaining that idea that I'm not a self. Well, no, because you just claimed the entertaining of it, and you're calling it you again. So, right, that's what I'm. That's but what I'm, I'm, that's not the out, case. How do you get out of that? Realizing you're not in it. There was never a you to claim anything. There's never been a you that did anything. What's been entertaining here has never been you. It's been mind. Yes. You haven't entertained a damn thing. You're something the mind's entertaining. The idea of being a you. Yeah? So when the mind asks itself, it's not you asking, it's the mind. So even that question, the question in that way is, so, so even the question in that way is more self than that. No, it isn't. It doesn't have to be. It matters if you think it's you that's asking the question, then you'll think it's selfing. If you realize it's just a question that came up, then you'll get some value out of it. Can you realize that when you still think you're a self? <laughs> I mean, a, from this point, because I'm not you, I, 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 I self. I'm, I think no, I'm no, self. no, 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 no. You're not selfing. There's no doer that's like doing selfing. There's selfing going on here. That's right. Selfing, when selfing's going on here, and it's not seen clearly, it produces a sense that you're the one that's doing the selfing. Exactly. Yes, but it's not so. That's selfing. There isn't you that's doing it. So what, so what do you do? Just say, oh, that's not self. I just sit what I just said. That probably will work. See, the thing is, here's selfing going on. Oh, sorry. I just self myself out of here. Here's selfing going on, right? So here's selfing going on. It's a verb, but it's also finite. This is based in time, yes? So it's not an infinite verb. It's selfing in time. Okay, so here you are. So there's the selfing. It's going to be hard to do this, my little demonstration. So here's the selfing going on. Can you hear me? So, yeah. Okay, so then you hear that, you hear something about selfing, all right? So now you're, now you're going, oh, I recognize that as selfing, right? But there's a feeling that it's you recognizing it. That's selfing. So here's selfing going on. Selfing, if, it, if, it's being, if it's been listened to, sooner or later, the idea of being a self is going to pop up. So the verb now has an addition called the noun. Yeah? So instead of just streaming, it now becomes noun and verb. So now it's you that is being self that, or you're doing the selfing. That's also selfing. Yeah? Okay, now you see more of the selfing. Suddenly it pops up, you're seeing it. Yeah? Now you become the noun, and somehow you have you think you have something to do with it. I'm saying that's selfing. Yeah? 
every time the mental has the mental condition raises one of its pop ups and wants to start it and start seeing everything from this as the end all and be all, this noun part, that's selfing. Now, you can get that with just a little segment of seeing selfing, or maybe you're going to have to see more of it. What happened with me was, I, w- I started having that sense, I could see the selfing, but then there would still be the feeling that there was a me seeing the selfing. All right? So then I had about six examples of, I really thought I was on the, on the rim of the context, looking in the content, but after a little while, the circle kept getting bigger, and I was always in the content. Whatever arose in my mind was content, yeah? I needed about five... It's like Ramana Maharshi describes it really good. You're in... You're at a movie theater. You're watching the movie. You're sitting in the theater. You realize the movie's not real, but there's a sense that you're real, yeah? He says the circle's bigger. It's not that the, the movie, the film, the uh, screen is in the circle. You watching the movie is in the circle. Whenever you arises, it's in the circle, so selfing, the whole point of selfing in a way is to pop up and become a noun, to produce the feeling that the mind now goes, oh, it's me, yeah? Just check it out. Hey, maybe it's not me. Then you'll realize, and after a while, it's a finite string. The selfing doesn't go on continually, and you're going to come to the end of it, and there's a pause, and that's eternity. The pause is an eternal event. Yeah? And sometimes, when that pause is sufficient enough to you, you never fool fucking again by the selfie. It stays verbing. It doesn't pop up. Yeah? Because it's up to you, in a sense. It's your, it's the mind that produces the pop-up. The selfing doesn't the produce the pop-up. The selfing is the advertisement for mind. The mind makes the leap itself, and boom! It's me! I got this! It's me! I'm clear! It's me, I found my authentic self. No, no, no. <laughs> the self thing is finite, and then when you hit that pause, either you see it and oh a pause, but a pause is eternal. You are you are in the state of timelessness of mind, and it's available at all times. The selfing is just a stream going on underneath the ocean of that. Yeah? It's just a surface activity that our attention and interest is on. We're like skimmers. We're not going deep, yeah? And we keep going, popping up, popping up, popping up. Yeah? You see that? So it's not like you never did anything. So there's nothing you have to not do. It's just a realization there is no subject. There is all subjectivity. There's no personal subject. It just seems that way. Yeah? To what? To mind. It doesn't seem that way to an animal. When an animal looks at you, it doesn't think you're Joe. And how, I wonder how Joe's doing at the office today. It fucking just sees you as that, I'm gonna get petted or food maybe. A source of that. Yeah? We're the only one who have this incredible idea that we're the subject of all subjects. It's amazing. I remember my brother was very, very big and he was my older brother and he thought he was really cool and we were at Jones Beach one day and we were walking back to the car and he didn't have a shirt on. I was about 10 and he was, you know, about, he was about 15. And then, and then suddenly a big seagull shitted on his shoulder and I had so much fucking fun. You know what I mean? Just shitted on his whole fucking story. <laughs> the seagull didn't care. Oh, Dan, that's Dan Hedeman. He's so, oh, I'm going to fly away. It had a shit, it's shit, and he was underneath the, the projectile, he got shot on. That's what happens. Yeah, it's not fucking personal. And this isn't personal. It's incredibly intimate. Life is incredibly intimate, but it's not personal. It's incredibly intimate. I feel you you become, in a sense, more of, a, of an individual when you realize you're not one. I do. You, Like that guy was saying the other day, you do become uninhibited in a lot of ways. You become brazen, in a sense, because you, you're assured, you know? You rely on something that's reliable. And you have to take your own counsel on this. The unspoken yes can't be had by someone else. Yeah? All right, that's it.